Hello everyone, Dan here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a review for Kill Your Darlings, number two. This is a new book from KLC Press and Image Comics. Uh, let's talk about the creative team before we get into this book. This book is written by Ethan Parker and Griffin Sheridan, with art by Robert Quinn and letters and design by John J. Hill. Um, so we continued this book. Uh, I was very excited to read the second issue because I really enjoyed the first issue. I thought it presented some really solid and interesting ideas. Uh, I think the world that it's building, it's it's creepy. Uh, there's a, a fun, entertaining story, uh, and it leaves a lot of questions to be asked. So what I was expecting from this issue, and I, I think it really delivered in solidifying and cementing some more of those ideas, uh, continuing to build out this world in, in a few ways. Uh, you know, there's there's a few parallel stories going on. We know there's a story from way back in the, in, in time uh, as it opened in issue one. We continue that story here. Uh, we'll see some preview art for that. Uh, and then we also continue to follow Rose and her journey. Now, I have a quick theory about uh, some stuff that I'll talk about later on. So stay tuned for that. But in this issue, the terrifying new saga continues. After the fateful fire, Rose finds herself a social outcast. As whispers of murder and insanity plague her, she begins to question everything she's experienced. Will the truth of that night confirm the grisly rumors, or will reality prove to be even stranger? Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, this book, I didn't know where it was going to go after the end of the first issue. You know, Rose is there. She uh, She's lost her house. She's lost her mom. Everything, her world is upside down. Uh, and then in the meanwhile, she's also worried about if this imaginary, if these, if these uh, visions that she had, was any of that stuff real? Was any of that stuff the like in in something that really affected the world, or is it all in her head? Uh, and we continue to explore those ideas. Now, one thing I do want to mention, and let's go look at the art. Bob Quinn is doing such an amazing job with, first of all, differentiating the time errors. Right, this is a couple of pages from. Uh, another flashback that we see, uh, to, we continue to explore that world that we saw at the beginning of issue number one, that timeline, uh, to explore what some of these themes and powers that are being explored here are. Uh, so, first of all, very cool coloring, like very bright, very different from the world that we see from Rose. As we move on, uh, and I don't have anything too spoilery, but we see Rose is at this institute, uh, and they, you know, they're trying to help her, but just so many visuals of like Rose being by herself and she this is a time jump eight years have passed uh, from the events of the the first issue as you can see she's older um, and still just like the little I think the visuals of the pills and the medications and things that are like just really bring to life that there's trouble going on she is a troubled individual uh, and and the world kind of treats her as such. Now that she's here, we have a very quick scene with uh, the director of the uh, Institute talking about some of the, you know, explains what the Institute is, but in, in, in doing so, it also elaborates on how the world sees Rose, that she has to be there, right? Uh, and then, you know, Rose sitting by herself, uh, not a lot of hope. She does get a visitor later on. I won't go too much into details. It is somebody from issue one. So I'm glad to see that there's still at least a connection. Uh, but then after that, the issue gets really bonkers. Think of a, you know, of a kind of a great escape, but in a way more magical uh, uh, tone. So I really enjoy this. I, 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 I don't know what's going to happen next. I have a theory and I don't know that this is going to come to fruition. But I'm going to throw it out here <clears throat> and you guys let me know what you think. Uh, so for those and this is a little behind the, you know, inside baseball, behind the scenes uh, for KLC subscribers, we knew that this, this book was coming. It was titled Project 8. Uh, now, at the beginning of the book, Rose is eight. And now eight years have passed. So is every issue going to skip eight years in between? We know this is going to be a mini a limited series. Uh, so my thinking is that is every issue like eight years are going to happen and they could do this various ways, right? Uh, they can keep Rose not aging the same because maybe she goes back to that fantasy world. 
Uh, I don't know. I just thought it was an interesting idea of why the title would be called Project 8. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Stay tuned in the chat. Let me know if you think that's a valid theory. So if you have read this issue, let me know what you thought about it down in the comments. Stay tuned. We have some covers, uh, a really cool Ryan Stegman cover, variant cover for this issue that uh, you'll see at the end of the video. So Hello everyone, Daniel here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a review for Swan Songs number four. This is a new book from Image Comics. Let's take a look at the creative team before we get into this book. This book is written by W. Maxwell Prince with art and a main cover by Caitlin Yarsky, letters by Good Old Neon. Uh, and we also have multiple variant covers that you can see at the end of the video. So as I've covered these, uh, these issues, this is an anthology about things ending, right? Uh, so in this issue, the end of a sentence, a man obsessed with sad lips gets out of prison only to find himself totally lost in a world of crime and fill-in vocabulary. W. Maxwell Prince obsession with cessation continues featuring this issue superstar artist Kaylin Yarsky, uh, which you may have seen in Black Hammer. The end of the beginning is the end. These are the swan songs. So, yes, this is about an individual who is in jail uh, or has been in, it has. Yeah, it's been in jail. So this is about the end of their sentence. But sentence also refers to the Mad Libs that he enjoys doing while he's there. So, you know, W. Maxwell Prince has just such fun, weird uh, ideas that. I don't know. I don't. I don't even understand where some of those things come from. Like, what in, it inspires something like that. But the more I think about this issue, the more I like it. I think it's a really fun idea, especially the way things kind of play out. Uh, because, you know, as we follow the character, we know that he's done something wrong. But you know, W. Maxwell Prince manages to characterize him as somebody who maybe has repented, somebody that has wants to be better, wants to. Uh, recover uh, as they go out into the real world again. Uh, but, you know, life after prison is tough. Like it, it is an adjustment, like just like any, anytime something ends in a new beginning of something else, it is an adjustment. It is a, something that you have to change. Now let's pull up some of uh, uh, Yarsky's art. I think I just really like the representation, like these establishing shots and the little facial expressions, like it doesn't seem like you're really, um, you know, I, I know it's a prison. Maybe he's, his spirits are uh, a little bit upbeat because he's doing something that he likes and he's also getting out of jail pretty soon. Uh, but you can see the, the tone starting to change as we kind of move forward. Things get a little darker. His brother's there to pick him up. And of course, you know, you fall right back into, into bad habits. You fall right back in with the wrong crowd, even if it's, uh, you know, like even just the coloring of his brother's vest and the car, like how different it is in tone from everything else. It tells you it's something is off. Um, I think the other part that manages to really impress me is the use of the Mad Libs um, the device and all sprinkled in throughout the story. Uh, and it also manages some really fun things. You'll see some of the variant covers, uh, a little bit of point break, if you will. Uh, I'll leave it at that, not to go too much into spoilers. But yeah, this 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 story was a lot different than the previous one. The other ones have been a little bit more high level, high concept like endings. This seems to be like more on a micro level, uh, more on an individual. Uh, but yeah, it's still very effective, especially the way the book ends. Um, I think it's a really, it's I think it's a really fun way to do things. Sometimes every every once in a while, you want something. That's just a little bit different. So, uh, yeah, I can't. I, I think we have one more of these anthologies, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, yeah, I'll definitely I might do a whole video on like all of them put together as a maybe if there's some thematic things that we can discuss. So. Hello everyone, Dan here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a review for Big Game Number 4. This is a new book from Image Comics and Miller World. 
let's talk about the creative team before we get into this book. This book is written by Mark Miller with art by Pepe Larraz, Giovanna Nero on colors, letters by Clem Robbins. This has been one of my favorite things to read every week that it comes out. Uh, I just I want to get it. And it usually doesn't happen because uh, I'm not able to get to the shop immediately. Uh, so here we are now. I'm finally here talking about big game number four. This is the penultimate issue of this series, this big blockbuster event in all the properties of Millwall. So very excited to talk about it. So let's get into it. The Chrononauts might be dead, but Hit Girl can use their time travel technology to go back to the world of Empress. This is literally the maddest and most brilliant book out there right now. You know, I'm not going to disagree with that. Uh, the comic book event of 2023 is a must read for anyone who loves Miller World books and every single character is here for the fun. Yeah, you know, I think my favorite thing about this specific issue is that we were already dialed up to like the biggest craziest insanity and then miller and company go like hold my beer we're not even done yet let me introduce this whole new aspect of this this story and here we are so as the villains have been cleaning up in our current timeline hit girl is now back in this other this other time where things are going to get super extreme. So let's uh, take a look at some preview art so I can talk a little bit more through that. So here is Hit Girl landed on a, a different place where there's obviously dinosaurs, but there's also these other whole kingdom of people that uh, take them prisoner. They'll take take uh, Hit Girl prisoner because, unfortunately, the last chrononaut that she was with, died, like he was already dead, right? He, she was just using the suit to time travel, uh, but now introducing time travel to these people, it was going to set off the next chain of events. Um, this is amazing. I love Pepe Larraz's work. Uh, I was lucky that I recently was able to purchase a print from Pepe Larraz. If you check that video out, if not, go check it out. But just look at all the detail here, the blood splatter from the dinosaur, the expression on Hit Girl's face, how like, even though it's from far away, there's still a little bit of like, goofiness to it i really love it facing off with the gun just everything and of course giovanna's colors like amazing amazing just i really love how this book is laid out uh to maximize the the awesome factor i think uh let's take a look at some of the other pages here here we are going to this other um kingdom to meet the king and boy this is like the worst thing that could happen has happened, and now we're even going to make it worse. Um, we get a really nice establishing shot of, like, how uh, how un unmerciful this this ruler is uh, as we kind of get into meet. Uh, he hasn't even met Hit Girl yet, so there's a lot of plans. Um, I get a lot of vibes, you know, like big villains like Thanos, Dark Side, like that type of stuff. It's what I feel like is coming. And then, like I said, you're not even ready for what happens later on in the uh, in the issue. So a lot of fun. I think really cool setup for the ending of this book. I feel like this book is also going to spin out into maybe a larger thing. I think Mark, Mark Miller has a lot of ideas that he's just not done with. And there is no way to contain him in just one mini series. But this has been a really fun way to build it, right? Nemesis Reloaded is the, the setting foundation for this. Then we have Big Game uh, kind of going on onto like, the bigger picture and then from here we can spin out either some other series maybe a different event uh so i'm very excited for the future of this whatever it is even though i haven't read all the properties that are involved in this i'm still very excited about this uh so hello everyone Dan here from the next issue podcast on today's video i'll be doing a review for Beneath the Trees, Where Nobody Sees Number One. This is a new book from IDW, and I'm very excited to finally get to talk about it. But let's get into the creative team before we talk about this book. This book is written and illustrated by Patrick Horvath, with letters by Hassan Otsmane Elhao. Uh, and I really love the presentation of the credits as this like small-town newspaper, because it's really setting up everything. Uh, I think the cover 
although it doesn't give away everything, it's very representative of we are what we're about to find out, right? There's a really interesting juxtaposition of themes and topics in this book. But before that, let's talk about what's going on in this book. In this issue, this is a small town serial killer upstanding citizen and adorable brown bear samantha strong's cardinal rule do not murder the locals after all there's a sea of perfectly ripe potential victims in the big city just beyond the forest and when you work this hard as sam to build a cozy life and thriving business in a community surrounded by friendly fellow animal folk warm decor and the aroma of cedar trees and freshly baked pineapple of uh, freshly baked apple pie the last thing you want to is to disturb the peace. So you can imagine her indignation when one of Woodbrook's own meets a grisly, mysterious demise, and you wouldn't blame her for doing anything it takes to hunt down her rival before the town self-destructs and Sheriff Patterson literally starts barking up the wrong tree. Live, laugh, shed blood. It's Dexter meets Richard Scary's busy town. Uh, so... This is a very apt description for everything that's going on. Now, I will tell you this. I had not read anything uh, from this. Uh, I had not read like anything about this book before we got into it. I just I saw the cover and that's all that uh, I thought was going to happen to it. Like I want to go in fresh. I don't want anything to kind of because even the even the uh, comparison to Dexter and scary and, and busy town uh, like that would still kind of color my impression of the book. But uh, yeah, let's get into some preview art as I talk more about this book. So first of all, I love how charming and beautiful and just innocent this art looks, right? All the little character designs with the big heads and every, you know, a little animal town, a little small town community. You can tell just because of the way we have these little shops, we have the the, the little dialogue that's very sweet, like, you know, and we meet Samantha and we don't think anything of it. Um, and yeah, it's just it to me, this felt like it was going to be a nice a slice of life story. But I knew there was something more right just because of the cover and the bloody sack. Uh, but we get to see all the characters. I just really love the little characters, how cuddly and, and like innocent they look, the, their little eyes, especially any character that wears glasses, super innocent, which glasses, unfortunately, it's a a uh, very um it's a theme that we meet martin here who's kind of always looking for his glasses so that's a little bit of, of something that happens and then as the book progresses which i think this book has excellent pacing of like revealing little bit coloring the town and then giving you that like nice juxtaposition of like oh yeah by the way this is a book about a serial killer and we're now going to get into the nitty-gritty uh, I think Sam is a really cool character to follow. She's very methodical and just very, very interesting with everything that's going on. So I I really like the book. Like overall, it was just such a fun read, a fun discovery. And then, yeah, I was a big fan of Dexter. So like this naturally kind of appeals to me as a like murder mystery within a murder, like murderer's mystery, you know. So very fun stuff. Highly, highly recommend you check this out. Like I said, beautiful art. I don't I don't think I've read anything prior by uh, Patrick Horvath. So I might look for some more of their work because the art is beautiful. If anything else, the art is fantastic. So Hello everyone, Daniel here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, we'll be doing a review for Grim number 14. This is the penultimate issue of this arc. We are getting, things are moving very quickly now uh, and getting very excited. But let's talk about the creative team before we get into this book. This book is written by Stephanie Phillips with art by Flaviano. Rico Renzi on colors, letters by Tom Napolitano. In this issue, the end is in sight and Jessica will have to confront it the one who destroyed her father along with any chance of knowing him. New revelations also come to light about Lila and her unique relationship with death, and Jess will have to make some pain painful compromises concerning Adira. Is everything said to be right? But if Adira fails, will the Reaper stay on her side or turn against her? <sighs> yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, I don't want to get too much into the details of what happens in this specific issue because I think those are really nice reveals, but we will go through a little bit of stuff 
uh, as we see some of the preview art. But I quite enjoyed this issue once again. Uh, like I said, the pacing feels like it's accelerating and it's all being driven by a combination of like this story that we're learning about and then just the really cool art uh, by Flaviano. Um, I want to I want to show some art. So let's talk about the, the let's talk about the preview art. It's a real. First of all, we started with a with a song again, which we hadn't. I don't think we had seen a music in a little while, uh, so that's really nice. Uh, and then we get to see this progression of like, you know, the forbidden fruit, maybe like a little bit of an uh, homage to that, or at least a callback to something like that. That's the thematics of that. And oh boy, this transformation, it is fantastic. I love. I love this art. I love the design of this character. I think Renzi's colors here just really make everything pop out in the page. Really nice, specifically in this third page where we have everything burning down around. Uh, yeah, so really cool. And of course, this the name of the issue is Black Sheep and as the song plays. Um, and then we go back over to Jessica and everything that's going on. She's just Jessica is having such a tough time with everything, uh, and I feel like we're gonna things are gonna get worse before they get any better, because she's had to make a lot of compromises. But once again, just I love these character designs, all the little details in the characters, um, you know these little uh, creatures that that she's holding. So, yeah, it's all very very cool stuff. So, I'm really enjoying this book. I think it's so much fun. For this week's advanced review, as you guys know, we've been doing some advanced reviews. Uh, it's a book that I'm pretty excited for just because of the creative team behind it. Uh, we're going to be talking about Hack Slash, Back to School, number one. There's a new book from Image Comics coming out uh, next week. So you can see this is by, with story and art by Zoe Thurgood. Uh, the original Hack Slash was created by Tim Silly and Stefano Caselli. Now, before we get into this, have any of you guys read Hackslash stuff before? Nope. No, no, no one. Interesting, because this—I mean, it seems like a pretty. I feel like there's a Hackslash book at least every other year or something over at Image, uh, like from the from since whenever I can remember. Uh, so, but yeah, it's interesting that we don't. So, before we get into this book. I wanted to ask, did you guys feel like this book was accessible enough without having any back, hack, uh, hack, hack slash yeah. knowledge? Uh, oh, I'll yeah. to you first. Yeah, I had never read any hack slash. And so uh, just going into it, I, I wasn't sure of the character. But the this issue pretty much kind of sets everything up for you. So it lays out who the character is, kind of what she does. And then she stumbles upon somebody who says, yes, we have a school for people like you. And then you get to meet the other schoolmate. So it's very accessible. It's, it, I mean, it's like perfect if you've never read anything before, because I kind of learned who the character is, learned who she's going to school with, and now kind of uh, where the story is going to go uh, right. in the second issue. Yeah. Jeff, did, did you feel it was accessible? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've seen like hack slash on the, on those comic shelves before. So I knew it was like girl, big guy, I, I thought that they were like serial killers or whatever. I, I didn't know what the premise was really. I just knew bloody comic girl, big guy. Uh, so you kind of get that right away uh, in this. It is. It does feel very Buffy meets, I don't know, uh, you know, that she goes to the school. So it was like, it kind of reminded me of that. What's that Zack Snyder movie? The, uh, oh. Uh, oh, sucker punch. The, sucker punch. Sucker Punch. Sucker Punch. Yeah. It's sort of uh, like a little bit like that, kind of. A little bit of Umbrella Academy kind of. Yeah, thing. yeah. I mean, X-Men too, right? Obviously, there's a school. Yeah, a little right, X-Men. So. Yeah. Uh, cool. A little bit like that. It was, yeah, it was super accessible. It was it was, it was good. I, I yeah. really enjoy Zoe Thurgood's work, so uh, yeah. like her artwork and stuff. So, Well, let me give you guys a quick synopsis of the book. In this, uh, it's, it's going to be a miniseries. In this, the returns it returns with an untold tale uh, and critically acclaimed cartoonist Zoe Thurgood at the bloody helm. Slasher hunter Cassie Hack is only just getting used to her man monster partner Vlad. Uh, so there's the there's the girl, the big guy trope that uh, <laughs> we was talking about. 
Uh, when she is drawn into a new case involving a murderous bunny mascot, dead kids, and an entire squad of maladjusted teenage serial killer hunters, a completely new chapter in the beloved long-running series that's perfect for new readers and old fans alike, just in time for Halloween. So, I mean, def- this was definitely by design, right, that they wanted mm-hmm. to bring in a new audience and make it accessible. Uh, of course, they're you're using a creator like Zoe who's, like, Kind of blowing up right now she has a lot of really good work and and it's just kind of a, it's a very different thing uh from some of the other work i've read uh i guess because it is adapting something that already kind of exists uh there's a lot of gore <laughs> in a horror book yeah but it, it, it's like it is gory but it's not i don't know like it's still kind of fun to look at in a weird way it's Does fun to sense? look at is it? I will. I will say there is also like a bit of in in my mind. Like I was talking before, when I think of uh, right. Axe Slash, I think of uh, like I think of like those Catholic schoolgirl outfits. I think it's like a in my head. It's always been a comic for like teenage boys mm. because it is. It's because it does seem very violent, and then there's like girls in miniskirts and you know whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why I just on the cover it's never really i've never it's never appealed to me so i do think it's an interesting thing that they've chosen zoe thorogood who does not who maybe appeals to a different audience to say look at this stuff yeah uh maybe maybe they are trying to bring in just a different uh maybe zoe's got range maybe zoe can write books for a teenage voice too yeah yeah let me pull up some preview art uh because these are the opening pages and i won't go too deep into it but as you can see (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of the pacing of this, like just kind of slowly zooming out for these first few panels, mm-hmm. and then the big reveal on the next page of like, oh shit, things went down, right? Yeah. Um, I I like the news narration of like this is kind of how we're gonna tell you what's going on, and then things escalate pretty quickly. I think after this, we get a little bit of like who is Cass, who's Vlad, like what what's their relationship like. Uh, I like. The narration boxes that are like notes from a diary that feels very personal to the to the character, and I like the character designs. I just I really like the layout of the book. It's fun because we've always been sharing on social media like some of the behind the scenes process for this stuff. Uh, but and the next page after this, if you guys remember that the ones that have read it, is insane. I I thought about putting in in the slideshow. I decided against it because I think it may spoil something, but also it's a pretty graphic, like it's probably one of the most graphic pages in the issue. Um, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. I, I think the book overall is, is very straightforward, a lot of fun. And I, I'm interested because it's only a mini series, so it's not a big commitment. Um, and I just kind of want to know more about these insane characters that are introduced later on. I really hope that turns on a, like a page flip like that. You yeah. Flip the page and then it's oh like, yeah. That's a that's an art that doesn't get talked about much of like these page reveals, especially because I read a lot digitally since we get the previews uh, digitally. But like, yeah, I guess that's something to check out for when we when I get the issue. Um, do you guys have anything more to say about the book without going too deep into any spoilers? I I just remember my favorite line from it was uh, when they were introducing the characters. They had the goth girl running away, and she and she says, "Oh, that's our resident goth girl. Your eyeliner's making her. You you, you have so much eyeliner, you're making her uncomfortable." <laughs> uh, I think the pug is also pretty fun. Um, oh, the pug is great. Is yeah. it the same? Is it the same characters every book, or is it a different girl, big guy every book? Do you know? I think. I'm not sure about that. I think this this says it's a lost chapter, so I'm thinking we do follow maybe Cass in the in the main series. Maybe that's who we end up following. This feels like almost like year zero for her, maybe yeah. if that's what it is. Mm. Uh, but that's a good question. Baby I don't know. Slash. Yeah. So I'm not sure. I know there's a lot of. For some reason, I thought Hackslash was like a technological hacking type of like book, but. But I've never kind of put it together. So really cool stuff. I enjoyed it. I'm glad we got to read it a little bit early because I had been waiting for it. Um, and here's some of the varying covers. So if you have read this, let us know what you thought about it down in the comments. But feel free to remember the question of the week. Who is today? Shut the comments.